Chapter 8. No new messages on my answering machine. I stood still just inside the door and looked around my apartment office. The squalor reminded me too much of the room just vacated. My underwear strewn on the floor, shirts, jeans, and dirty socks kicked into one corner, spilled over stacks of magazines slated for recycling. The air was stale, stagnant. I crossed the room and opened the windows to get a cross current of warm air going, swirling in dust eddies. Up on the mantle over the twin radiators were framed photos of my parents, my college friends, Matt Chavinsky and his wife Jean at the agency's annual barbecue, Mrs. Chung behind the deli counter making me a roast beef sandwich, my attorney Marguerite Laubach in Finland on a bobsled, her crazy black curls snaking out from under the baby blue crash helmet. No pictures of Claire or her art, my collection stored in a walk-in closet at my parents. No immediate textual evidence that I was still carrying the torch. I wasn't really carrying it anymore. Having burned so long and far down, it had set my hand ablaze, the coal fire now a part of me. I couldn't drop it even if I wanted to. If. I started cleaning my apartment. There were three dirty glasses, four empty paper cups, and two full ashtrays on my coffee table. I stacked the cups and ashtrays, carried them into the kitchen, and dropped them on top of a full wastebasket. Clawing the glasses together in one hand, I carried them to the sink, already a mess of glassware, mugs, and silver. No cooking utensils or plates. I squirted in creamy dishwashing liquid, and with the water running, I began washing and rinsing. Before I knew, the sink was empty, and clean glasses were drying on the rack. I sopped up the water on the counter and threw the paper towel away. I lifted the trash bag from the basket and tied it. I put in a fresh bag. Then I went around the apartment gathering up dirty clothes. Cleaning was the sort of mindless activity I needed just then, my ideas always flowing more freely with my hands busy. I figured out some things, and on top of that, by two o'clock, I had an apartment I wouldn't mind being found dead in. The man's death meant nothing to me personally, and for all I knew, he deserved it. But the girl was mixed up in it somehow, and I was some up, somehow mixed up with the girl, or simply mixed up. Either way, I needed to know, know as much as I could. Plainly, he hadn't died accidentally. But it's always good routine to rule out the obvious. Nor had he committed suicide. Everything else aside, his side, a suicide would lock his door. Murder then, the who. The what, the where, I thought I knew. The when. Rigor mortis had resolved itself and the man's muscles gone flaccid, dead over 30 hours or longer, depending on the weather the day before. I'd have to check. But tentatively, late Wednesday or early Thursday morning. Any longer, I would not have been able to stand 30 seconds in there. Something else to go by was the dog bite on his arm. He was the one who stabbed Pipe with the beer bottle, probably to get him to let go. Gloria had taken the dog to the vet's Thursday, Tuesday morning. The white gauze bandage on Wiley's arm was clean, no blood soaked through, so it hadn't been a first dressing. A second bandage had been applied after the bleeding stopped. All this at least gave me a framework to tack other facts onto and ask further questions like how, like why. Robbery didn't seem a likely motive, but I had no way of knowing what was missing, only what wasn't. His wallet, stereo, a camera, and a selection of drugs. It could have been an interrupted theft, but why would the perp stick around to apply the bag to the guy's head and leave behind the goods? No indications of a premeditated attack. The hunk of wood he'd been struck with belonged in the apartment. Same with the electrical cord, and maybe the plastic bag, too. Suffocating him with the bag meant the blow to the head hadn't killed him, so whoever dealt it was a strong person checking his swing, or her swing, or a weak one giving his or her all. Not a random act. The missing answering machine cassette meant prior contact with the victim, at least one phone call. No signs of a struggle, a spontaneous attack. Supporting this was the soda can and the stain down his shirt, as if he'd been hit on the head while taking a sip at his ease with someone he knew, or thought he knew. Nothing at all on the scene pointed to a hit, nothing remotely professional about it. 
Amateur night all around, and me emceeing. Hopefully that meant the cops would clear it all up without ever having me to get involved at all. Just keep telling yourself that, I told myself. I lit up and smoked. The phone rang. I let the answer machine answer. It was my mom. I picked up. She said, hi, dear. Did you get my messages? Oh, just got back, mom. Haven't had a chance. I made room on my desk and emptied my pockets. A phone bill, a pay stub, and a roll of film. How are you guys? Thank you for my flowers, she said sweetly. I have them here in front of me. I smoothed the phone bill, reading over Ted Wiley's long-distance charges. They covered the period from March 27th to April 29th. I'm glad you liked them, I said. How's Dad? He's out with the dogs. They're worse than kids. Most were San Antonio, Texas numbers. But in the last week of April, three calls were made to Burlington, Vermont, all for under a minute. I kept things rolling with Mom. Weather's been nice here. Beautiful here, too. We've been eating dinner outside on the patio every night. Sounds great. I looked at the pay stub. In addition to Ted Wiley's social security number, it gave the address and name of his last employer, Ellis D. Entertainment Productions, Inc. on West 21st Street. Have you been eating, dear? Yes, Mom, thanks for asking. You've got to eat, she said seriously. How's everything else? What have you been up to? Oh, you know, I slid the papers aside, all your worst fears coming true. Business better? I twirled a roll of film on my calendar blotter. Well, business is business, I said. And? My mom had a preternatural ability to tell when something was wrong. I only wish she passed it on to me, but I guess actually it's a mother thing. I heard a buzzing from the corner of my desk, Gloria's beeper vibrating again. I'd almost forgotten about it. I picked it up and read the number of the incoming call. It was the payphone at the dot-com cafe. Mom, gotta go. I've gotta call this person back. Who, a client? Being a snoop, on the other hand, I did get from her. No, it's an idea sur surfaced. I dial if I dialed the payphone number, I'd only get a faceless voice. No way to track the person it belonged to. Unless... Mom, got a pen? Now? Good. Take this down. I read off the payphone number. Call that number in 15 minutes. Set the oven timer. Who is it? Doesn't matter. Hang up as soon as someone answers, okay? Is this something you're working on? No, it's, look, just, I'm helping test a friend's phone, but I've got to be there to, look, just call the mom, number, okay, mom? Okay, okay, you don't have to shout. I'm not shouting, I said, then brought it down a notch. Okay? I love you. I love you, too. Don't forget to make the call. You just make sure you eat. Yes, goodbye. I had 15 minutes to get back to the coffee house on 10th Street and A. I used five of them to change my clothes. Just good routine, really. Altering my general appearance before going over the same ground again, but also the rot of death was still on me. A pair of black jeans and a blue sweatshirt with a frayed collar. I also changed my sunglasses to a pair of darker tinted Turkish shell wayfarers. I brought along the roll of 35 millimeter film I'd taken out of the camera at Wiley's apartment and on the way dropped it off with my card at a one-hour photo shop on Avenue A. I was back in business. I got to the cafe with three minutes to spare. Seven customers were huddled inside scattered around the cool dark room. None of the computer monitors were on. All the keyboard, keyboards and screens dusty. The fad there already fading. Maybe one morning everyone would wake up and notice, hey, we're not in outer space yet. We've only been circling and circling the planet, still trapped here. Nobody was at the rear of the room back near the payphone. I ordered a large dark blend, which left me with $3. The woman behind the counter gave me a puzzled look, sliding my cup across. You changed your clothes, she said. I smiled and shrugged. In front of the cash register were piles of postcards advertising local nightclubs, concert appearances by bands like Bowery Angels and Low Down Payment. I grabbed a handful of club invites and sat down in a cracked vinyl chair by the door, pretending to read them while sizing up the customers. A pasty-faced young couple with matching vermilion hair were fast asleep, slumped down on a long, low settee. Their slack, puffy faces <clears throat> breathing fitfully as foundry stokers. Another couple, 
more vertical at the other end, were speaking French and waving coca cigarettes in the air, spinning out blue smoke and snip, snipping off wisps. A young man with curly brown hair wearing Walkman headphones and sunglasses like old-fashioned welding goggles sat semi-silently mouthing a song. Seated across from him, a young woman was writing in a rice paper journal. A chicken-necked man with, a, with tarnished white hair and face stubble like embedded glass sat at the bar talking to the woman on duty while she steamed milk for his cappuccino. Five minutes passed and the payphone didn't ring. I started worrying mom had forgotten her call too soon. Served me right either way to using her as an operative. Idly, I shuffled the postcards I'd gathered reading over the invites to local clubs, distributed throughout the village in thousands. Shake your weekend weary booty after hours at Fugitive's Den. 113 Orchard Street, one block below Houston and three west of Ludlow. Doors open 4 a.m. till... Thursday night hop in the underbrush, 296 West 14th Street, resident DJs Marcus and Mike Syke, doors open, 10.30 p.m., $7 with flyer. One in particular caught my eye. LSD Entertainment presents Raven Lunar Chic every Friday midnight at Hellhole, 66 West 21st Street. Industrial, Gothic, and Dark Electronica and nigh rooms of feverish dancing. Move your abused bodies to music mixed and manipulated by Master DJ Saint Sane. Seek and ye shall find, I remembered, slipping the card in my back pocket. Finally, the payphone rang. I looked up to see who'd answer it, but no one in the room moved. Motion and light at the back. The restroom door swung open, and a tall, thin man stepped out and stopped the phone ringing. It was the man in denim with the black Fu Manchu I'd seen gardening in the vacant lot in Alphabet City. I was too far away to hear what he said, but suddenly he craned his neck back from the receiver and looked startled. I waited for him to hang up and waited. He spoke into the phone, then listened, then listened some more. Not good. Hang up, Mom. The man stiffened. He inclined his head from within the receiver and cast a long, probing look around the room. I kept my eyes in front of me, fumbling out a cigarette. Maybe it wasn't her at all, but someone else on the line. I lit the cigarette, then dropped it in the ashtray after only one puff. The man, holding the phone to his chest, raised his voice, deep and sightly sibilant, like he had a tooth or two missing, and called out, Is there a Peyton here? Terrific. My chances were, choices were, sit there and ignore him as he had a chat with mom or get up and tip my hand, tip my hand completely. Not much choice. I had to find out what she told him. I got up and walked over smiling. He studied me from behind murky orange lens shades. I said thanks and grabbed the receiver. He passed by without a word, emitting a warm odor of fertilizer. Hello, I said. Oh, hi, dear. Good. I thought I dialed the wrong number. Your friend Jimmy didn't seem to know who... Mom, you're killing me here. What'd you say? Say nothing. I told you just hang up. Oh, I know, but I forgot to mention, and you never return my calls, but Sally Marshock's daughter is going to be in the city this week and looking at schools. I gave her your number. I knew you wouldn't mind showing her around. She's very attractive and smart. She's going to be a marine biologist. That's great, Mom, but you're sort of ruining the moment here. I looked around the cafe. The man was gone. Look, gotta go. Call you later. I rushed to the door and looked out, but couldn't see the denim man anywhere, <clears throat> up or down the sidewalk. Then I glimpsed him across the street, going into the park. I left behind my undrunk coffee and a cigarette smoldering in the ashtray. Such waste. While in third world countries, drowsy smokers dozed off in sweatshirts.